Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 9th, 2022 Community Formation Commission meeting. We'll call this meeting to order at 5.34 p.m. Sam, can you do a roll call? Sure. Commissioner Adam Malika? Absent. Commissioner Alonzo? Here. Commissioner Chavez? Present. Chair Escobedo? Here. Commissioner Kim Johnson? Commissioner Rachel Johnson? Here. Commissioner Killebrew? Commissioner Rodriguez? Commissioner Here. Rodriguez. <laughs> Commissioner Sander? Here. Commissioner Wood? Here. Vice Chair Zapet is absent. And Commissioner Reynaud? Yes, I think Commissioner Killebrew just signed on too. Okay, great. I will reflect that. Thank you. You have, you have a quorum, Chair. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next, we'll move on to public comment for items that are not on today's agenda. Sam, do we have anyone from the public that would like to give public comment? Let's check. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on items not on the agenda, Please click on the hand raise feature. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Sam. So we'll close public comment. We'll move on to the administrative agenda. We'll start with 4A announcements. And the big announcement I have is that the city has set our presentation date for with city council. And it's gonna be on April 22nd, which is a Friday at 1 p.m. That will take place at the Gephardt Room, Chair and Commission. That's at 630 Garden, right? The... Correct. Thank you. So other than that, no other announcements. And we'll move on to 4B, which is consideration and action on the draft Community Formation Commission meeting minutes for February 16, 2022. Are there any edits to the meeting minutes? Not seeing any. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Move. I'll second then. We have a motion from Christian, a second from Rich. Any discussion? Not seeing any. Sam, can we do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Let me just open it up to the public. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item 4B, consideration and action on the draft community formation meeting minutes for February 16, 2022, please click on the hand raise feature. If you would like to speak on item 4B, please raise your hand. There are no hands raised, so I will begin with roll. Commissioner Adam Lincoln. Commissioner Alonzo. Aye. Commissioner Chavez. Yes. Chair Escobedo. Yes. Commissioner Kim Johnson. Commissioner Rachel Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Killebrew. Yes. Commissioner Rodriguez. Yes. Commissioner Sander? Yes. Commissioner Wood? Yes. Vice Chair Zapeta? And Commissioner Reno? Yes. Motion passes. Perfect. All right, so we'll move on to the first of two items that we have today. Today's meeting should be fairly short. Um, but the first item that we're gonna go to, item five, is a discussion of the survey outreach. So the exciting news is that we were able to get the survey ready and we've now released it. Um, it's out there in the public. I just wanna thank uh, Lizzie, Rachel, Louisa for all of your hard work, um, Cami, uh, the folks at CCI. It was a long haul to get here, but we got here. And the outreach has been amazing. Thank you to all the commissioners that have sent it out to their network. Um, we have sent it out to so many folks and I, we're gonna continue to do that. As of Monday, we had almost a hundred. I imagine that we're far from a hundred uh, today. So we're gonna get an update tomorrow morning um, and we'll send it out to the commission in terms of numbers. Rachel, Louisa, Lizzie, did you um, wanna add anything before we talk a little bit more about the survey itself, some of the information? Okay, 
So we wanted to just open up this space for any questions that, that folks had. We know um, the email we sent out was really long. It had a lot of information, uh, but we wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page. What we sent out in the email was um, the link to the Survey Monkeys, both for English and Spanish. We also sent out the posters that we could circulate around the community to post up. They have QR codes and the link to the, the survey. The, um, who am I forgetting? It is linked to an IP address, so uh, it will be limited submissions. The idea is that we get one per person. Um, if, if needed, we do have paper surveys that we can make available, but reach out to myself um, if reach out to me if you need paper surveys for your group we want to make sure that all the paper surveys that we give out we get a, get back so the idea would be that myself or one of the um, the focus group members would be there to pass them out and also be there to collect them and then we're going to work with city staff or, or someone else to um, enter in that information Rich? Is somebody set up for the lived experience focus group already uh, for surveys or no? Not yet, but I, I'd love to work with you on that and, and be there to um, facilitate the survey. Yeah, I think that would require paper uh, because yeah. we, we have iPads, but if it's only one per IP, that won't work. Yeah, I could definitely make a paper surveys available and I'll work with you after the meeting to coordinate. Great, thank you. That works. And uh, Christian? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thanks to the all the folks that worked so hard to get this off the ground. Um, can you remind the commissioners and the public uh, what the deadline is again for submitting uh, the survey? Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that, Christian. The deadline for Submitting the survey will be March 22nd, and I believe it's at midnight. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, team. So March 22nd at midnight. 11.59. 11.59. Yeah. 11.59. So um, get the word out. If you're watching this, make sure that everyone in your network, if they live or work or spend time in the city of Santa Barbara, that they get a copy of this survey. Um, did I leave anything out? Uh, those that are in the survey work group. Louisa? I would just like to, you know, I've done this in the past, but I would like to say thank you to all those who have sent it out already in our in our commission. Um, I would really hope those of you who have not yet, or if you would, and those of you who have, we need to get this word out. So please reach out to people in the focus group if you have ideas, if groups that we're missing, please send it to your communities, your people, your, you know, get the word out as much as possible. This we need to get as much um, uh, feedback from our community as possible. Now is the time to get to do the work. So please, please, please get out there. Thank you. And make sure that um, as we send it out to our network. Uh, folks on the commission that you CC Louisa and me so that we can document who we reach out to and we can follow up with folks just to remind them as we get closer to the, the due date. Right. Thank you for that. Rachel. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to on the kinds of updates that we're going to get from CCI. So the, the, the reason too, we kind of want to track where we've already sent outreach to and things like that is um, we're, we're not going to be getting uh, updates on, on responses to individual questions, primarily what CCI is gonna be updating us on in the next two weeks is you know, how many total surveys we're getting and if there are demographic groups that are really overrepresented or really underrepresented to help us continue um, that, that broad outreach over the next couple of weeks. So um, the, 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 more, the more we can know, you know how it's been sent out and to whom, the better we can also kind of use that information from CCI to make sure we're continually outreaching um, strategically in the next two weeks. So now is a good time to open it up to folks if you have any questions that you feel like um, you have a good understanding of, of the survey and, and if you need paper surveys to reach out. Rich? 
Um, just to be clear, I've, I've sent it out and I just CC'd Gabe and Louisa on that. Is there another form that I need to update on that or is that it? That's no, it that. and we'll, we'll update the form. So we just get copied on it and then we document who, who we've reached out to to this point. Awesome, thank you. For, uh, I've sent out emails today. For all of them, I had to send to someone to send it out to the listserv, but uh, is that fine? Does that make sense? Yeah, I saw the emails and, and you even um, named the group that you were sending it to. So it, okay, it great. worked for us. Rachel? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that because because Rich, I sort of did similarly at the college, you know, sent it to some individuals who are now responsible for the all campus emails and things like that. Um, so with those, I think um, it, it would be helpful if if you end up getting confirmation that that has happened to then also like update Gabe and Louisa that um, just because we also, you know, if we send out to a whole bunch of folks this week um, and hear nothing back, we also wanna know that so we can maybe reach out again to those organizations or make sure uh, make sure they know that the dead, what the deadline is as well. I kind of had to push the college to, you know, delaying it a week and a half, like their normal email calendar might not work um, in time to actually get folks to respond by the 22nd. And Sam, I wanted to confirm with you. Um, so we sent a press release out to all the local media outlets. Uh, we also, I believe, are going to share it via the city's listserv. Is that correct? Yeah, and that just went out on, um, yes, yesterday. Okay. And uh, is it also going to be in the newsletter that the city sends out? Yeah, that was also, um, let's see, that was sent out. That will be in the next week's newsletter, excuse me, on Monday. Okay. Thank you for saying that up. You're Lizzie? welcome. I'm just wondering if we can also send it to the um, CFC um, email list. The interested parties list? That's a good idea. Sam, is it possible for us to send it out to the interested parties list as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll include that as well. Thank you, Thank Sam. You. Jordan? Uh, this might have been already covered, but have we sent it to the Chambers of Commerce, South Coast Chambers? Okay, thank you. Rafina? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if, is it possible to see like an updated list or one that's live, like either on a Google form or something? Um, just because I had written some emails and then when I looked at a list that was sent to me after that, they had already been sent. Um, so I just kind of don't want that to happen. Um, so is that possible or how do you want to do that? Let's, um, that's a good question. Rachel, did you want to take this one? Well, um, yes, because I, I mean, I, I feel the same. I, you know, I've sent out a number and heard, oh, great, I've already heard this from three other folks. And I mean, I think in a way that's a good thing. It means like our networks are all interrelated and, and we're all getting the word out. So like, I'm not Hopefully that doesn't, you know, bother anyone that they hear about it multiple places. Um, what I'm doing with, like, I would just suggest, like, let's just keep, I guess, keep Gabe and Louisa updated, like, because, right, I mean, I think that list seems to be changing a lot. Like, it was the same with some of mine. I just stuck with the, all the groups that I had contacted regarding the focus groups. Like, we tried to kind of streamline that as, like, if they had a point of contact already, um, but I mean, ultimately, I think it's a good thing if people are hearing from multiple folks, right? Like it's your network and you have relationships with people um, and, and we might have relationships with the same people. And I, I feel like overlap can only help us at this point. Definitely. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, guys. It's, uh... oh, hey, Demo. Hey, so just uh, updating you. Um, I've... I'll update the list i just did this uh today but i've um sent uh the survey info to uh, the company i work for at folio to some slack channels we have and then um i'm also sorry can you say that, that out demo can you say that one more time more slowly just so that <laughs> we can get that yeah uh, i said i'm sent i the information for the survey uh i've sent out to some uh channels on slack that i uh, at Appfolio, the company I work for. So uh, we have some, you know, with Slack, you have some channels for some groups that are, you know, interested in community issues. And then um, I'm sending that to uh, Santa Barbara College of Law 
at also maybe some other schools I might partner with Lizzie on. Um, and then we're having an info session um, at the Santa Barbara College of Law on uh, March 18th. Um, so that'll just be like a, it'll be like a kind of like the focus group, but we, we weren't meeting in person until recently. So I'm just gonna use that to just answer questions. And if anyone else wants to join, that'd be cool. And then we can just promote the survey again at that because it'll be four days before the survey closes. So. Sounds good. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up with you. Uh, it'd be good to have another commissioner there for the presentation. Yeah, sounds good. I also have one of our, um, I'm interning for Judge Hill and he said he would be willing to speak at that because I kind of, he's very uh, active in those issues. So. I thought it'd be a good way just for him because he has some perspectives on those and he'll just kind of give a broad kind of um, just because just to engage, like, I think a lot of more students will come out if he's coming. So um, I just asked him if he wanted to just like give some perspective on the issue. So I'm pretty excited for him to talk. Yeah, that is exciting. For the CFC part, we should probably stick to um, our standard presentation that we've been giving. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited yeah. to hear about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Like that'll be like kind of separate, like just for the student, the law students, if they want like, to have a discussion about those issues. After Sounds the presentation. Yeah. All right. And then Rachel. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add to that because I mean, I think that brings up a really good point is like, we're also going to probably hear back from a lot of folks in our network asking questions and things like that, especially if they haven't gotten an introduction, like an introductory presentation. Um, so I think that's just a good reminder to sort of, um, we, we need to stick to our, the, the information that was in those introductory presentations and the actual draft recommendations themselves. Um, just because now that we're in the survey section, we just don't want to, um, we don't want to run any groups that sort of look like we are leading people to do the survey in a particular way or not. So just to keep that in mind, like I know people aren't planning to do that, but um, you know, now we, we kind of need to leave that in the hands of folks to do on their own to, to, for the most part. Yeah, thank you for that. And we also sent it to the POA and um, to Lieutenant Hill and Chief Malekian and um, Lieutenant Hill, uh, it was sent out to uh, the full Santa Barbara Police Department. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions, comments on the survey? I did also want to say before we close out this item is the focus groups went really well. Um, we had a lot of people sign up for them. Um, they're really successful. Thank you, Cami, for connecting us with some excellent facilitators. Everyone had some really nice things to say about them. So I'm convinced we're going to get some really good information. They had amazing feedback as well. They really enjoyed the people that they spoke to, and they said there was really thoughtful conversation in all nine of the focus groups. So That's I'm looking amazing. forward to hearing the, the assessment that CCI puts forth from it. Thanks. All right, uh, anything else for the commission before we open up public comment? All right, I'm not seeing any. Sam, uh, is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on this item? Give me one second. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item five, discussion of survey outreach, please raise your hand. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item five, discuss discussion of survey outreach, click on the hand raise feature. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Sam. So we'll close out this item and we will move on to item six, which is the discussion with our special guest today, who is the independent police monitor from Boulder, Colorado, Joseph Lapari. And I'll turn it over to Cami to do a more proper introduction. Thank you, Gabe. So um, I have asked Joey Lapari to come and talk to all of you today for two reasons. First of all, he is an excellent example. I think I've spoken with all of you before of how the oversight community is so amazing at coming forward to help other 
communities, answer questions, help them with issues, and help them not to have to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. And Joey is an excellent example of this. I don't think I've ever asked him, um, sent out the call for help and that he hasn't answered. So um, he's just an excellent example of what, what the oversight brings, oversight world brings to other communities um, out there. But I also brought him because Joey has, he, he does a lot of things out, he has a life outside of oversight. Um, and if he wants to share any of that, he can. But um, he also brings a lot of perspective. So he's worked in several different agencies. He started out as the director of the Civilian Review Board in Syracuse. He has served as an assistant inspector general for the Office of the Inspector General for the NYPD. He has served as the deputy inspector general um, for public safety for the city of Chicago. And he's now, as Gabe mentioned, the independent police monitor in Boulder since the year 2020, July of 2020, I believe. And so Boulder is a very similar size city um, to Santa Barbara, and it's a fairly new agency. And so I thought it would be great if he could come and talk a little bit about what his agency does, the scope, um, the, the workload, so that you could have a better idea of what that might look like in practice and also have some opportunities to ask some questions. So thank you so much for being here, Joey. Happy to be here. Thank you, Cami. That was a very kind introduction. And, you know, the reason um, I do, I'm, I'm happy to jump in to, to assist is because when I first got started in the field uh, about 10 years ago, uh, NACO was there for me. And there were so many people in the field that welcomed me into the field, helped me find training, helped me understand the challenges I was going to be facing. And without NACO's support, um, I don't know um, how long I would have been able to last in the field. And NACL is also important almost as um, moral support for you as you go through this work and run into obstacles and challenges. And you can, um, it can be difficult and you can sometimes get discouraged. And so to be able to reach out to other people across the country who have had the same experiences or working through the same challenges as you all uh, is, is, is just, un it is just valuable to an unparalleled level. So I'm so happy that you all have been in contact with Cami. Um, con continue that. Um, I'll start off just with a, a couple um, thoughts, and then I'll talk about the Boulder setup here. Um, I have a couple of observations from the recommendations, if, if you all want me to get into that. Um, but also keep in mind that I'm, you know, you all are there in your community. You know what's best. Uh, this is, you know, any sort of observations or advice I provide should be taken with um, with a grain of salt because I'm not there in your community and you know I know the field and I know you know the the dynamics but I don't know your community so uh, I, will, I won't I'll try not to make any presumptions um, but provide um, observations that that may be helpful as you continue down this road um, and then get get into any questions that that you all have as well um, the first thing I want to say is congratulations on getting this far and the, I was really encouraged to hear, it, it may not sound encouraging to you all, but when Gabe said, it's been a long haul to get here or something to that effect, that's actually a good thing. Um, the, the more time you take to set the process up, the fact that you all are doing surveys, um, focus groups, bringing in all the stakeholders, you're doing exactly the right thing. Um, and and that, that's excellent to see. Um, so stay on that path. Um, you know, Take your time as you're going through this. Be thoughtful as you all clearly are being and you'll get through this um, in good shape, um, even though there'll be challenges along the way. Um, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the, the current setup we have, uh, or the setup we have uh, in Boulder uh, and how it was created and sort of how we operate and maybe some of the initial challenges we've run into uh, as we've been getting this set up over the past year and a half, almost two years now. Um, so like many communities, um, the call for uh, a, a revision to the existing civilian oversight mechanism in Boulder occurred uh, after a viral event or an event that, that was recorded and went viral. Um, and there was a recognition by the city council, um, you know, encouraged clearly by the public outcry uh, that they needed uh, some improvement, some strengthening of the oversight uh, operation. Prior to the current setup, there was a uh, an oversight civilian, it was a 
it was half civilian, half police uh, staff panel that was within the police department and sort of operated by the police department. And so uh, the public felt that it needed to be separate from the police department with its, its own uh, separate administrative uh, setup with its own uh, director or monitor, as we call it here. Um, so it was a, 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 a fairly significant change from what they had in the past um, that the public decided wasn't fully working um, or not working to the public's expectations. So they, they went through a process. Um, they created a implementation team, I think maybe similar to the way you all are set up and kind of trying to sort of work through the nuances and the options that you have to choose from and, and how you set this up. Um, that was a, a, a mostly civilian uh, sort of volunteer panel. There was a few city staff members to assist, um, but it was largely uh, citizen driven. They decided that they wanted to uh, bring in the monitor before they finished the process of their legislation. Um, they, they felt like it would be beneficial to, to bring someone in with experience around the country to help work through some of those last um, nuances of the ordinance that they were working on. They had already made a lot of progress by the time I got here in July of 2020. Um, but my first task here was to help them complete the legislation. Um, and they, much like you all did, um, you know, brought in as many stakeholders as possible. Um, by November of 2020, we had the legislation fully passed. And then our next step was to actually create a process for identifying or, or allowing members of the public to apply to be panel members and then going through the um, interview and selection process. So that's, you know, I assume you all will have that ahead of you as well. That takes a lot of work. So, and you know, make sure you leave yourself enough time to do that well, to advertise for it, to get a diverse set of applicants. Um, once you have your panel members in place, you will, and this was our, our first challenge, was to um, start developing bylaws for the panel's operation and to, and to really create the process of reviewing the, the complaint files. Um, and that was a part of the, the bylaws discussion. Uh, our ordinance did lay out the basics of the review process, but it, there was a lot of gaps to be filled in. Um, and you will find that along the way. Um, you can't write a legislation that will cover everything. There will be uh, certain things that will need to be left unaddressed or, or um, not fully you know, specified. And then you, you bring that greater specificity um, and you fill in those gaps in your through your bylaws because uh, you, you do want some structure around you know, all of your procedures and, and processes. Um, so the way the process works here in Boulder, we have nine panel members. Um, as the monitor, I classify all the incoming complaints to determine whether they're serious misconduct um, or regular misconduct to, to cat classify um, which of the rule violations it should fall under. That's an important step because um, it can give it can give the help give the public confidence that um, you know fairly or unfairly, rightly or wrongly, there may be members of the community who feel like um, you know the, the police department is um, you know uh, misclassifying things to lower their seriousness or sweep things under the rug. And so having a, uh, a civilian, independent civilian, make those classifications can add some confidence to the public about, okay, everything is being um, captured and classified properly at the outset. Because you can have situations where if it's not classified properly at the beginning, it can complicate your process as you, as you go through it. So getting that initial classification um, done properly is important. The Here in Boulder, um, once I've classified it, it goes to the professional standards unit in the police department. They're like the internal affairs uh, operation for the police department. They conduct the investigations. Um, but I, as the monitor, have real-time access to all of their, um, their documents. I sit in on the interviews that they conduct with officers, with uh, the complainants, with witnesses. Um, I can make suggestions or recommendations um, in those interviews if I feel something wasn't asked that needed to be asked or some area wasn't covered. Um, we have a process where um, I, we step out of the room. I make the recommendation to the investigator um, 
and the investigator is still the investigator. I, I we made it very clear from the beginning that the monitor, because the monitor at the end of the process reviews the investigation and ultimately has to sign off and say whether the investigation was thorough and complete. By having the monitor operate as an investigator, it was almost it would almost be like the monitor reviewing their own investigations and that would be sort of a conflict of interest and so we took the monitor out of the role of direct investigator and but did empower the monitor to to be present at all interviews and to have direct access to all documents related to the investigation uh, and so that that way the monitor can spot any deficiencies uh, before the process is completed and can make a recommendation to you know cover this part of the investigation uh, more thoroughly, or um, you know, add this, add this, um, you know, provide an analysis on this question in your investigation before it gets to your board. Uh, I saw in your recommendations, your it looks like you may have a process where the the board or the director can send it back to the department, which is can be which is a good thing. But hopefully, you want to, you want to get to the point where the vast majority of the cases and in the investigations that you're receiving. From the, the from the department, from the internal affairs or your professional standards unit, are thorough and complete, and you don't have to send a bunch of cases back. Um, so the monitor or the director um, and the director staff can assist in that process. And, and over time, the the director will get a sense of what the board will be expecting and looking for. And if they don't see that in the investigation before it gets to the board, they can point that out to the department and say, "Hey, you need to beef up this section because I know the I know the board is going to be asking about this." Uh, and so it can help make the process efficient by ensuring that the the first investigation is complete and thorough and fair. Um, once the investigation is complete here, I receive the, the, the completed investigation documents. Um, at the same time, at, I should back up a little bit. When the complaints initially come in, as they come in, you know, one month, and then the following month, I will I present I provide the uh, our panel members, which we call them panel members instead of board members. I provide them with a summary of the complaints that came in from the previous month, anonymized, so they they, they don't know the name of the officer or the name of the community member, just the basics of the case or the basics of the allegation. This is really before it's even been fully investigated, but. They will get a summary of the case and take a vote uh, in public about uh, whether they want to conduct a full case file review of that case. Um, it's probably too much to expect your, depending on your, your caseload, how many cases you have, it's probably too much to expect your, your, your volunteer board to, re to review case files for every single case. And so you'll need some kind of process to, to identify the cases that you want to review. And, our panel created a, a set of criteria that they put out publicly, like to say that these would be the sort of factors that we would weigh as we decide which cases to, to conduct the full case file review for. Uh, but I present, I provide those summaries to them each month at our public meeting um, without discussing the case in public because it's still a confidential case at that point. It's still under investigation. Just we just use the case numbers they'll vote on whether to conduct a full case file review or not for each case. And so we will typically have roughly five or so cases a month and they will typically choose two to three cases to do the full case file review on. Once they've selected those cases, then um, you'll have to develop a process where panel members are either, or board members are either assigned to the case review or you have some kind of standard schedule where people know, okay, this week, I'll be taking this case. Um, your director will you know, have to provide those, those records to them for the cases that they decide to review. Um, and then I, you know, for our process, the, 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 our panel is empowered to review the case with all of the records and then make a, make a couple of different recommendations. First, the disposition, whether the case should be uh, sustained, whether the allegations, I should say, should say, should be sustained against the officer or the officer should be exonerated or not sustained or unfounded. There's all these different options you can come to. If they sustain it, then the next responsibility is to provide a disciplinary recommendation to the chief. Um, and we have a disciplinary matrix here. I would, if, if you all, if your department doesn't have a disciplinary matrix, which is essentially like a guideline of, 
um, sort of categories of violations and options for discipline to give some structure that kind of like how judges use sentencing guidelines where it says he gives you the judge sort of a, a, a frame of options uh, or a set of options for discipline. It's a similar idea. Um, and you can have mitigating or aggravating circumstances to bump the discipline up or down, but you would hopefully use that disciplinary matrix to make that recommendation uh, to the department, to the, the probably the chief, uh, who I assume is the final decision maker, um, provide those in writing. And then I, saw, I see from your recommendations that um, you would have a process where the, the chief would respond in writing, which is, I think is good. You don't wanna leave that open where, the, the board doesn't know what the outcome was or what the decision was. Um, so I think our processes, our process here in Boulder is pretty similar to what you all have put into your recommendations. Um, the, what we, the, the main difference I think is that you all, it looks like are looking at having the option of a contract investigator for whenever the director or the board determines that the two rounds of investigations have not been thorough enough. Um, we don't have that option here. Um, we do have the option to keep sending it back to the department until the, the, the panel feels like it's a thorough investigation. But part of my job is to make sure, as I said earlier, that it's thorough before it gets to the panel. So um, we haven't really had a situation where we felt like we needed an independent uh, separate investigator. We do have um, independent, um, our, our funds for, outside counsel, if we ever legal, if we ever need outside legal counsel, uh, if there's ever any sort of conflict of interest and we don't feel like we can get legal counsel from the city, uh, occasionally you'll run into situations like that. So having some independent legal counsel at your disposal is, is important. A um, Couple of quick observations I would make just from reading the recommendations. Uh, again, take these you know, with a grain of salt. These are my thoughts and observations from the outside. You all know your community. Uh, better than I do, but um, just a couple of sort of items for food for thought that um, you may want to uh, talk through or think through, continue thinking through. Um, I did notice the reference to, at a certain point, I think three or four years down the road, there would be a, an audit to determine whether there were any conflicts with the charter, the city charter. Um, I would strongly encourage you all to do as much of that as, as you can before you pass your legislation to, to identify any of those conflicts. It becomes harder once the legislation is actually in place and, and um, active to, to make changes. It's not impossible to make changes and we do that um, sometimes when it's necessary, but try to identify any of those charter conflicts before passing anything and, and resolve those um, with what, whatever you end up uh, passing before you, you pass it. Um, the question of subpoena power uh, is often really um, critical in this discussion and it's often something that um, community members are, are strongly pushing for. And, and it can be helpful if you're an agency that is doing investigations yourself or contracting out an investigation. Uh, there can be situations where you need a subpoena. So I, I wouldn't discourage you all from having that subpoena power, but my observation on that is you don't wanna rely on the subpoena for cooperation from the police department and to require officers to participate in the investigation. You, you should have, it's better to actually have that written into the legislation that as a, as a employee of the city, as an employee of the police department and the police department itself is required to cooperate with the director and, and the, the board um, and required to appear for in investigations if, if so called upon, because you, you don't want that, that ability dependent on subpoena power because subpoena power can be challenged. I don't know your union out there, uh, how hardball, how much of hardball they sort of play, but in some cities you will have police unions that um, would, and I've worked in a city, my, the first city I worked in, they would be willing to challenge every subpoena you issue to an officer. And if it gets challenged, you're in court, you're delayed potentially months. So you don't wanna have to rely on subpoena power for department cooperation, write that into your law that they're, the department is, and the officers are required to cooperate. Uh, figure out a way to write that in a way that you know, folks can, that, that's useful for the agency, but um, it, it's also something that the, the police officers and the department um, can, can be behind. What is important with subpoena power is if you're doing investigations, and I've been in this situation before where 
um, it, you know, it happens at a gas station or a hotel or some other private business, many businesses will not be willing to provide you with information, specifically surveillance videos that you will that will be critical to your investigations uh, without a subpoena. So um, this is not a you know uh, um, not discouraging you from having subpoena power, but just more of like where it's where it's helpful and where it can actually make things more difficult. So in the in the sort of the private businesses, when you need to get um, documents or video surveillance from them, it can be helpful for your agency to have subpoena power. Uh, but it can be it can get complicated quickly if the union or the city or the police department challenges your subpoena when you're trying to do it, use your subpoena for the investigation for to, to get access to department information. So don't set yourself up to, I guess my thinking is don't set yourself up to make it more difficult um, and, and don't get distracted. Like sometimes subpoena power can be a very shiny object and you can kind of feel like, oh, we can't really have teeth if we don't have subpoena power. Um, but I think in, in my experience, it's more important to have that in your legislation and it's cleaner, it simplifies it, it's more efficient. Um, it keeps you out of out of court and, and legal challenges. Um, I see, I think there was a hand up. I noticed that I'm not... I'm not seeing. Oh, yeah, uh, Lizzie, did you have a question? And please feel free, anyone, to raise your hand in the, while I'm talking and just ask a question. Um, so, as you mentioned, that um, you see about five cases a month, on average, and on average. And as the monitor, how many of those cases do you um, do you attend all the interviews and like follow along the in investigations as it's going? Every single one of them. Uh, every all of them. Yeah. I need and to be, then, it's important for the, especially for the witnesses or the complainants to see the monitor or the director, the civilian person in there. It gives them confidence. It gives them, makes them feel a little bit more comfortable. Some folks may not feel comfortable in an interview room with a police officer, you know, if they have a, if they're filing a complaint. And so just having the civilian there is really important. Yeah. And, and at five cases average a month, it seems doable. Do you also, um, are you also doing the the policy and um, uh, data auditing um, simultaneously? Yes. Um, so I, I the the monitor here at Boulder is empowered to do that. Um, the legislation gives me uh, access to all the information I need to do that. That is very important. That's something I haven't mentioned yet. We were kind of focusing on the complaint process, but that is a, a really key role for for your your director or your monitor um, to have that ability. Um, in this first year and a half, I will say, you know, don't expect necessarily for your director to be able to put out a, um, you know, a, a real in-depth data analysis in your first year of operation because your your most of your focus is going to be getting your your operation set up, and that's kind of what we've been uh, doing. So I have my second annual report that's about to come out, but after I get that out, I am going to transition to doing a use of force report. Um, where I, we examine um, sort of use of force trends and patterns. And um, th that's a really key role for your director as well. So you would definitely want to have that. So I hope that we, we can get more into that. But I have one more question on this section. And then I'm sure I'll have more later. But um, so how often does your um, panel meet? So that there's the monthly meetings. And then do they meet in between as they're reviewing cases? So in in our first year, as they were developing their bylaws, yes, they would have not only their monthly meetings, but sometimes one, sometimes two additional meetings between those monthly meetings to continue working on their bylaws because it was just, it's too much to do in once a month. Uh, and they started off doing it as once a month, and then they realized this is going to take us too long. We need to have more meetings, at least in this first year. Um, so you may have that to, to that you'll you'll need to be prepared for. Then, as you start to set up committees, subcommittees within your your board, your those committees will need to start meeting independently and separately from the the monthly meetings. And then the case reviews, um, those get set, scheduled separately. Um, then you have training. You haven't we haven't talked about that, but that's a really important thing to do for the board members in that first year is, is expose them to as much training from the police department, from the DA's office, from community organizations, 
you know, every every entity that you think has knowledge or information that they will need to do this work, um, get that training done. So that first, particularly that first year, year and a half is really intense because it, it just takes a lot of time to get these operations stood up, to get people trained up, to get people communicating on, on all the right fronts. After you've been doing it for a, a, a probably two, three years, you know, you have your bylaws established, you things are operating more efficiently, um, you'll, you'll cut back on how many times, you'll, you'll cut back on the amount of hours that your board members are, are committing each week. Um, but if you, you know, were calculating all those things I just said, you know, that's a good at least 10 hours or so a month that folks are, are volunteering for. So I saw you all have a plan for, to do a stipend. I think that's a great idea. We, we do have a stipend uh, here in Boulder. Um, just to cover the expenses that people will have in getting to meetings and child care and elder care and things like that. So um, that's all very good stuff I saw that you had. Yeah, Rachel. Um, can, can you just tell us a little more about the amount of the stipends and how 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 you all determine that process? Yeah. Um, so we we're doing one hundred dollars a month right now um, for each of our nine panel members. There is, I'll say there is a sense, I think, with for most of the panel members that that doesn't really come close to the amount of hours that they're actually donating. Um, and we do have a, a program called Count Me In where we track their their hours that they're spending each month. And so that I would, you would want to do something like that, even if it's just a spreadsheet or something that people are filling in so that you can both prepare any new incoming people for like, this is what you can expect in terms of how many hours you're going to be um, committing here. But also, if you ever need to make the case to increase the stipend, you have some data there that you can point to and say, hey, look, these folks are actually really providing way more time in, in this service than we thought they would initially and that we sort of tied their stipend to. So it can be really important to track their hours. But yeah, we started off with 100, um, not really knowing what the, exactly the right number would be, but willing to budget for it in the future if we needed to make that adjustment. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, just a quick follow up. Um, I mean, have, have you heard anything from any of, of, of those serving on, on your board about, you know, challenges related to things like child care or elder care or um, has, has that you know, prohibited yeah, I mean, folks from participating at all? Well, we will, okay, we, I mean, yeah, every month we have someone who's like, my child is sick this week, um, we're in the hospital, I, I just can't make it to the meeting, or, you know, I have, um, you know, who, people have full-time jobs, they have families, so absolutely there are going to be um, times every year where your panel members, each of your panel members will run into some sort of challenge um, and you have to be go into it you know aware of that and sort of forgiving for that um, we did create some guidelines for our panel uh, if you miss like a certain number of meetings um, i think they decided on three then it it, it automatically triggers a discussion with the co-chairs of the panel that sort of ask hey what's is, what's the challenge here and you know, it's really important for you to be here um, and just kind of have that conversation. And if it continues, the panel has the ability to remove fellow panel members for, you know, for not not being able to participate. But um, I would, you know, we had one panel member that just moved out of out of state that things like that will happen. So you'll need to have and I saw you in your recommendations. You do have alternates sort of ready to go um, if you lose someone. But um, you know what I think you'll need to pay attention to, to sort of ward off ending up with a with a bunch of folks on the panel who then suddenly realize, oh man, this is way more work than I realized. I just can't do this. Is do your best in the the process, the front end process, to convey to people what the expectations are and what the time commitment is going to be and the training commitment, um, so you don't have people that get in and and understandably realize, oh, I, I don't have the time to commit to, to this. And it's not fair for me to be in this role if I don't have the time to commit to it. Um, so the most, the more you can do to prepare people for what they're getting into, um, the better off you'll be, I think. Hopefully, hope that answered your question. 
Any other questions at this point? Um, I have a couple of other quick yeah. observations I can make. I have a quick question. Thanks so yeah. much for sharing this, by the way. Um, sure. My question is with regard to staffing. Like how, how, how much support staff do you need or have, and how, how do you recommend us figure that out? That's a good question. Yeah. So I'm a office of one right now. Um, and when I when they created this office, they weren't sure if I would need a, a second staff member. And so we haven't made that decision yet. Um, I do have administrative support from other staff from other city staff. So I can tap other folks when I do need some administrative support. Um, but so far, the the work of the the monitor the day-to-day -day work of handling the complaints it's been sufficient to have one person what i haven't been able to do as one person is also do the sort of pattern and trend data analysis I've, I've had to kind of focus more on getting the panel set up first and then i'll be able to transition to, to do those sort of things um so if you don't have enough staff your your director may have to make decisions like that where okay I can't do this just yet I'll have to wait a year before I can do that um if you know I'm not an I'm not doing frontline investigations here though in Boulder if you all end up with a operation that is doing investigations or is contracting out investigations that can be time consuming and you may need your director providing more time to manage those investigations, depending on how many investigations they're having to do themselves. Um, hopefully that's not a large number. Hopefully that's sort of a rare occurrence where they have to tap a, a contract investigator. Um, it, it is time consuming to manage a volunteer panel or a board. Um, everyone has, you know, schedules and needs. And so you, I, I, I do spend most of uh, probably more than 50% of my time um, sort of helping to manage the panel, facilitating whatever they need, responding to their questions, responding to you know any documents that they need, um, helping them develop this process. And, and maybe as we go forward, I'll be able to pull back some as they become more sort of self-sustaining and they sort of understand the work themselves um, and more comfortable doing it themselves. So, I certainly expect your director to have spend a, a majority of their time in that first year or two helping to facilitate the panel, helping to support the panel, um, helping to organize their training. Um, and that, you know, depending on what your caseload will be and how many cases you're processing, it could, you could very well need a second person, one to kind of manage the panel more. And I, it seems like that's kind of the thought in the recommendations is the director would kind of handle more of the cases um, and the complaints and the, I forget what it's called, the um, the other role, uh, the ombuds would kind of help facilitate more of the panel. That made a lot of sense to me. There are times where I feel like this is a lot for one person to be trying to manage the, the, the caseloads, even though we only have five cases on average a month. Sometimes we get up to nine and those months can be nine or 10 complaints. And that can be difficult for the one person to try to manage both those 10 complaints coming through and supporting the, the panel or the, or the board or the commission. Um, so if you can have that second person, you know, I, it, it, it would be, um, I would be doing a disservice to your future director if I said, <laughs> you know, they won't need some help. Um, so it, it can, if you if you have the resources, if you can do that, um, you know that would be a good idea. If you if the resources are tight and you can't quite get it done in this first go around, you know keep it as an option that is something once your director is in place can develop some data, can show the city, can show the the uh, board members, hey, this is why I need some some assistance and why I need a second person here. Um, it's not the end of the world if you don't get that second person from the beginning, but if you can get it that from the beginning, that would be great. Right, and it'd also be good to communicate to them whoever's taking on that role, just clear it with like what to expect, so they don't feel like blindsided or anything. Absolutely, right? so, exactly. Yeah. So. Thank you. You got it, Joey. How how large is your panel, and how long are the terms? And have you had trouble in the past of um, filling the, the panel? 
we haven't had trouble filling the panel we had so we have nine seats nine panel members when we were developing the legislation there was a debate whether they should have nine or 11. ultimately they went with nine feeling like 11 might be hard to manage it might be um the, the more it, it, it can just become a little more cumbersome the more people you have involved in the process uh, i don't I've, I've also um facilitated a panel in another city that had 11 people so it, i think you all are thinking about 11 so it, you know it's doable but ultimately they decided to go with nine here um they created staggered terms that's that's an important question you asked because you don't want to start whatever your term lengths will be for your board members you don't want to start them all off with the same terms because then they will all come up at the same time and then you'll have to replace a whole board all at the same time so you want to stagger them so what we ended up doing was having two-year terms three-year terms for our regular panel members and they we also uh, our implementation team also designated two panel two of the panel seats as specifically student seats so someone from uh, either the local college university um, and they made those terms one year because they didn't want to discourage like a senior or a junior in college from applying because oh I can't do three three a three year term or two year term because I'm graduating and I'm I'm moving so we we created a shorter term for students uh, one year and then we um, we created an even number or well we had what uh, seven seats at that point I think we did four three year terms and three two-year terms uh, and then we just allowed the panel members that were selected to to choose which um, terms they wanted to do and if there was a if we had too many that wanted to do one we had a process where they could draw straws but they didn't ultimately have to do that they could they just decided um, they were just able to talk through who should take two-year terms and three-year terms but yeah definitely stagger them so you don't end up with a losing all your board members um, you have your alternates that's good um, and you know the other on the alternates if you can include them in the training when you start the training for your board members so that they've been and, and encourage them to attend the the monthly meetings and as much as they can attend so that they can kind of have a good sense of the operation and, and hit the ground running when they do get tapped to, to fill a seat um and so they're not kind of starting from scratch yeah lizzie um unless there are other questions related to um the composition and um i, I have one thing to okay make. i was just going to ask if you have any uh restrictions on uh law enforcement and what your take is on that if there's any we have, dynamic change or how that would be yet yeah we have the same a hot topic for us and we're trying to figure out so. yeah and, and that, yeah that is often um a point of contention we in our setup um, here in Boulder, we had the same language that you all have that um, and actually it's it's more it's broader it's it's not just you can't be a current. Um, member of the police department or a past member of the police department, you can't be a current member of the city staff or, or have a family member who is a city staff because um, they didn't want the, the, the board members or the panel members to have any connection. To, to city government to feel like they could be pressured or you know in, in any sort of inappropriate um pressure put on them um it's pretty standard fairly standard um in the field at this point i think some of the older some of the boards that were created 10 15 years ago like the one we used to have here in boulder included police officers um you will you will likely run into if you have current police officers on the panel um, on, on the commission, you will likely run into concerns from the members of the public that, well, you know, this is, um, it's not independent. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're getting told what to do by the police department. And that's, that's just not good for the process. What you do want is a good working relationship between your director, your board and the police department. And I see, I see you all have a liaison, a uh, police department liaison that's really good because your 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 director your board you will need someone in the police department to go to to ask questions and say hey what's the culture of the department on this not just what's written down but so sort of how is this operate in practice and what is this 
um, abbreviations stand for? How, what is this terminology? You could, it's very helpful to have someone in the department that you can go to who believes in your mission um, and, and, and wants to help you succeed and can, can provide you with the sort of um, inside perspective that you'll also need, not just the outside perspective of a civilian, but you'll need to be able to understand the, the culture of the department and uh, the history of the department. And so a liaison can help with that. Um, and hopefully your director and your, your staff that's running this operation will be able to develop a good working relationship with your the, the police department's internal affairs operation. Um, you know, I've been in cities where that relationship breaks down and it becomes very confrontational and it, it affects the entire process. And so you need your director to be able to interact with the internal affairs or the professional standards unit um, in a way that the police department sees that, that person and that operation as credible and legitimate. And um, even though they know they, that person will sometimes have to make recommendations that will sting or that will uh, not, uh, you know, you know, make 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 them feel like it makes them look bad or something. If you can, if the the director can develop some sense of of trust and credibility with the department, those recommendations and that process can go much smoother with a lot less heartache for the department, and they'll be much more likely to adopt the recommendations that you're making. If they don't, if it's sort of presented to them in a way that they see it. it it benefits the departments, the department and their credibility and the ability of the officers to improve relations with the community. Um, that's ultimately the kind of relationship I think, that, at least that I've seen in my, my work is, is most productive. Having said that, there are times when your director or your civilian oversight staff are gonna have to have a really strong backbone and you know they'll be getting pressure from different sides, from maybe from the police department, the union, the city, members of the public, organizations. And so you want your director um, to have that, that, that sense of personal credibility and ability to kind of stand in the middle of all the, the conflict and the disagreements and have their own perspective. Um, that was one, one point I, I wanted to touch on from the recommendations I saw. Some, some language about the um, COB, or the director having to act as directed by the COB. You definitely want your director to be responsive to your board and addressing their concerns and um, you know carrying out their intentions. You may get into some difficulty though with the language of having the board direct the the director. We had some language like that in our ordinance, and the attorneys for this for our city were had a pro, had a concern with volunteer panel members who weren't city staff having the authority to direct the city staff member uh, that can get unworkable potentially um and, and so just think through that you, maybe there's a solution there locally that where, where you can do that um it, it wouldn't have worked here um and so think about thinking about language that encourages your director to carry out the intentions of the board without necessarily giving the, the board the ability to direct the, the uh, director. The other reason that's important is because if your director does have to take a, a difficult position that is, that is publicly popular and is being pushed by the board, and it's something that the department disagrees with or doesn't like, it puts the director in a position of being perceived by the department and the city as, as being pushed to say something or pushed to do something by political pressure, by public pressure. You obviously, again, need your director, your person in that position to be responsive and sensitive to public input, but it doesn't help the director if they're seen by people that they need to convince as, oh, you're just taking that position because the panel or your board told you to, to say that and they've directed you to do that. It undermines the, it, it could potentially undermine the, the ability of your director to, um, have credibility and legitimacy with the police department. So just think about that. Again, I'm not saying, you know, you have to do what I'm recommending or suggesting, but just give that some thought. Um, the other language I noticed, there's one area in the um, recommendation that's that mentioned when possible. I think it was around the officer involved shootings that the, the, the board would be updated by the department when possible. Mm -hmm. Try to eliminate 
any kind of language like that 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 could lead to disputes over interpretation down the road. Um, you will, no matter how um, good your police department is, no matter you know how few complaints you have, you will eventually have a situation where there's some disagreement over. And if you have language like when possible, there will immediately be a debate about what that means. And people will take sides based on their interests in the, in the matter and not what, so, so just, just have a, a very clear distinction in, in the, in the ordinance, uh, in the legislation about when the panel, when the board should have access um, to information involving officer involved shootings and when they shouldn't just, I would encourage you just to state that clearly and not, not leave it vague because that, that will, when there, if there is an officer involved shooting, it will likely, could likely be controversial. And in that moment, it, it will be very hard to agree on what when possible means. Um, and so just, I would encourage you to think through that and, and clarify that um, before passing the ordinance. Um, I think that's all the specific for clarification I don't have on, more questions. Yeah, Lizzie. For clarification on that question about law enforcement participation, our, our city charter prohibits any city staff member, including um, SBPD, from participating in um, any boards or commissions. I think that the question that this commission has been grappling with is um, former law enforcement or law enforcement from other jurisdictions? Yeah, I have had, so currently we don't, we don't have a restriction against former law enforcement being on the board um, or the panel here in Boulder. We, but we don't have any currently on our board that are. Um, in Syracuse, where I first started, we did have a former police officer, a, a retired officer join the panel. And, you know, I, I tell you, it can be, it can be a real blessing to have sometimes to have a, a, the right person, you know, you, you, you wouldn't want a, a police officer who's, you know, has a history of, you know, say being like a union leader who, you know, opposed any discipline for their police officers, that perception would be bad and it, it would lead to conflicts within the board so the right person the right retired law enforcement officer could be really helpful um, to the panel it could, both on the credibility and legitimacy front with the the department and the city but also just that internal knowledge of you know you know in terms of understanding police culture and police language and um that that can be really helpful so the right person um who wants to who believes in accountability and wants to see this succeed i think could could be very beneficial um but you know i say that with caution that you wouldn't want to just take take anyone uh, particularly if they had a history of, of sort of resisting accountability or or um challenging police discipline uh, or discipline of police officers that would would not have be helpful thank you um and, and my question was, and this again, unless somebody has questions about the complaint process or the composition, um, my question is about the, um, the, the auditing. Um, how often do you conduct the policy audits and, um, and stat analysis and reporting? So for this first year, as I said, it's, I've gotten out one annual report so far. I did have another case that was brought to me, an older case that I was asked by a community group to review. So I did a special sort of review of that. Um, my plan is to, and what you should be aiming for is not only annual reports, but quarterly reports every three months that provide updates on um, the, you know, the data that you're seeing coming out of the complaint process, um, anonymized summaries of the, of the complaints and their outcomes. Um, that's, you know, you don't wanna, do that just once or twice a year because it's it's too long for the public to wait um, a whole year. And unfortunately, I have done that this past year, but it's it's not because I wanted to. And we're about to get onto the the sort of pattern of annual report plus quarterly reports. Um, as I said, I have not been able to put out a um, a sort of a a standalone 
uh, pattern or trend analysis yet. Um, I'm hoping to get my first one out this summer on use of force. We have recently had some newspaper articles and some questions raised about um, use of force and sort of use force data here in Boulder. And so it, it got to a point where I felt like, okay, that's clearly I need to address this issue. And so my plan is to do that in the next couple of months. Um, and after that, I think you know, it'll, it'll depend on the support staff, uh, sort of the, the staff support that the office has. If you have more than one person, they could probably more quickly getting get to the point of getting at least one or two pattern and trend analyses out per year. Um, but those take a lot of time. I don't want to I don't want to understell the, the amount of work that goes into those. Um, there can be challenges sometimes in getting the right information, getting the making sure that the data is being captured in the way that you need it to be captured so that you can do these reports. Um, the analysis itself can take, you know, a, a month or two, the writing, the drafting, um, getting your, your board to review it, having your police department review it before you put it out so that they can point out anything that, that uh, you may have said that's just you know, not consistent with you know, policy or something. So, you know, you, each one of those, a, a good pattern and trend analysis or a, a, a policy evaluation report should take a good four to six months to prepare. So, you know, if you have one or two staff, that, that's not going to be much more than, I think, two of, or maybe three of those reports a year. Uh, but that would be pushing it, I think, if they're doing it early. Do the pattern and trends reports and analysis include crime stats um, or comp stats as well, in addition to the complaints? It can. It, it depends on what you're analyzing and, and what you're looking at. You know, if you're comparing, um, say, use of force, if you're looking at use of force and you want to understand, um, you know, what parts of the city are seeing more use of force, it can be helpful and relevant to look at crime data and, and compare that as well. Um, but you can also do like the, the annual report that I'm about to put out that is really focused on the complaint trends. Um, I don't address anything about so crime trends um, in, in this report. So it just depends on what you're trying to get at. But yeah, you would definitely want your, your office to have access to that kind of data because depending on the report you're putting out, it could be absolutely critical to provide context to what you're talking about. Yeah, Christian. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Lapari. I uh, had the privilege of attending your February meeting, and I just wanted to oh, congratulate cool. your uh, your oversight panel on finishing the bylaws and getting <laughs> off the ground. I've uh, I've spoken with some of your commissioners, and uh, they would kill me for saying this, but if uh, if we do our jobs right and the city council adopts our proposed legislation, we'll be hiring pretty soon and. I don't know if you've ever been to Santa Barbara, but it's a lot warmer here than, uh, than Boulder, Colorado. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, just putting it, just putting it out there. Oh, <laughs> but um, I did want to ask you a specific question. We did do an audit. Um, Mr. Doimus, who's on the call, uh, who's representing the the city legal team, um, did an audit <clears throat> to look for conflicts in both state law and the. Uh, the city charter. So uh, we did kind of surface a, a, a pretty interesting conflict. So I want to summarize it briefly for you. Uh, basically, our California state public meeting law requires that business be conducted in open meetings uh, with few exceptions. So for reviewing things like litigation and personnel issues, uh, it's not unlike similar laws that you have in the state of Colorado. Our city charter also stipulates that a commission like the one we're proposing cannot recommend disciplinary action. So basically, uh, the charter states that only our city administrator can do that with few exceptions. Uh, so basically, uh, one legal opinion and one that I respect a lot uh, is that our COB cannot go into closed session to review case files because the commission does not have the ability to recommend discipline. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how this might affect the ability of our review board to do their work or to be effective. Yeah, I I don't see how you can have real discussions about these cases in public um, before there's been a determination made. I, I think the 
if you're, I mean, it sounds like the first hurdle you all would need to get over is a, a change to the charter that allows the panel, uh, allows the board to actually make disciplinary recommendations. Um, you, the, the, a compromise potential potentially could be that I don't know the exact legislation you all are dealing with, so this may not be operable, but you you could have a, a process where the panel makes a disposition recommendation, whether to sustain, not sustain, exonerate the officer, et cetera, but doesn't make a specific disciplinary recommendation. Um, I would, you know, I, I think for public confidence, for um to have a process that the board members feel is meaningful i do think it is better to have the the board be able to make this specific disciplinary recommendations but again based on a, a disciplinary matrix that your police department already uses um it sounds like that would take a charter a, a change to the charter um but if that were to happen you would definitely need to have these conversations in uh, confidential settings in closed door settings because you have issues of you know juveniles sometimes um that can't be discussed in public you have you know domestic violence issues sexual assault stuff that that comes out in, in these cases um you need to protect your complainants their their identity unless they decide to make something public um but most of your complainants um will probably feel like there is highly sensitive information in those complaints and in the police reports about them uh, and so you can't have a thorough, a real thorough, robust discussion that is fair to the to the complainant or frankly fair to the police officers if you can't really thoroughly discuss the case um, together. So if you all are planning to have a, a recommendation process where your board makes recommendations, um, particularly disciplinary recommendations, I, I would encourage the city to try to find a way to to allow you all to do that um, in private. Uh, and then when you when the case is closed and you've made your recommendation, then you put out quarterly reports that provide summaries, again, anonymized summaries, because you don't want to embarrass someone or put their, their personal information out there, but you need to be able to summarize the case to the public so that they understand the, the, the basic elements of the case and, and what was at stake here um, without exposing any, any, any one individual. Um, so you all will need, to be able to have those con those confidential conversations, particularly at the more you see cases, you'll start see you might start seeing the same you know same officer pop up. You might see, start seeing complainants, the same complainant, and so you you need to know the identities. You can't really just have this very general discussion of the case in public without knowing the without being able to discuss the details. I I don't see how that could work effectively or leave either side the police or the community having confidence in the process um so i would really encourage the city to try to find a way to have you all be able to do that thank you yeah i hope that answered the question and without creating too much controversy for you on it's, it's a tough issue it's it's a sticky it can be a sticking point um but you know i would just encourage all of you on both sides those folks in the city in the city attorney's office and in the uh with the the board members or the you all as the folks trying to implement this the police department and the union to really come to this with with an open mind and an effort to make this you know a real process that is meaningful and is not just sort of window dressing because your public will figure that out pretty quickly if, if it if, if it's set up as something that is seen as a sort of window dressing so you know i would encourage you know your city to your city leaders to have the the, the courage to to trust you all that you all are trying to be responsible and reasonable with this that you take this disciplinary process seriously um that this isn't a you know a, a political um gotcha game for any of any of you and so if, if you all can convey that clearly to your city leaders hopefully um they can come back with some with some trust and some confidence in, in you all sorry city leaders i hope i'm not making your life more difficult if you're listening <laughs> but i really want this to succeed and I, I don't want you all to to put yourselves in a situation where 
you don't feel like you've created something that is effective. And then a year from now, you're, you're debating this again publicly and, and trying to figure out what went wrong. So do your best as a group to get this right the first time. And um, Joe, I got a question. Um, through, the, through our presentations that we've done with community members, through our discussions, just things that we've heard, uh, there has been a concern raised that there may not be enough work to fill a full-time position. Um, and there's also been suggestions of having uh, staff support this that are not in the oversight uh, profession. It, in your opinion, um, would there be enough workload for a full-time position? And then would it undermine our current recommendation to have someone in the professional staff role that does not have oversight experience? So that's an excellent set of questions. Um, in terms of the staff, I definitely think you need your director to have experience in oversight, experience in investigations, to know police policies, to know police training. I could see a role for a, the person who is maybe supporting the board. That, that, that position, if that's mainly what they were, were doing, that's someone who, you know, you need that, the, the skill set is maybe different. You need someone who's comfortable, like, you know, setting up Zoom meetings and, um, you know, kind of badgering your panel members or your board members to, you know, sign up for case reviews and to get their schedule to you so you can schedule a meeting. A lot of that support is sort of scheduling and administrative. So I could imagine if you have a director that has all the right experience in terms of police oversight, I could, and in fact, the, what we've had the discussion here was, could we potentially do that sort of model here where I'm the civilian oversight person and then we have an administrative person to support the, the board. They would obviously work closely with the monitor or the director to support the board, but um, it could take some of that burden. Uh, it could be okay to have a, a you know, a regular, you know, city staff person. Um, you'd want to make sure that they're still committed to the concept of civilian oversight of law enforcement and, you know, not opposed to it or not going to be, a, you know, making things more difficult. But I could see that sort of um, bolstering the abilities of the director to do some of the other stuff, some of the other work that only someone with the right experience could actually do. Um, and sorry, your first question, I, I went to your second one. Remind me what your first one was again. Uh, I think it's... There's... Oh, the, the time, the, do I have enough work to do? Yeah. Um, so th that was a concern when I came into Boulder too. There was a lot of folks who said, you're not gonna have anything to do. Um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be bored. We only get a couple of cases, couple of complaints a month. They're not that serious. Um, what you will find when you create this process though, is that once the public sees that there is a civilian process to file complaints, you will probably see a little bit of an uptick in your complaints. You probably will get more complaints. What can I ask if anyone there knows what the average caseload is per month currently? Lieutenant Hill or Chief Malekian, I see that you're on. Yeah. Uh, Good afternoon, I'm Barney Malekian, Police Chief. And Hi, Chief. We, we, we average over the last five or six years, uh, right around 20 complaints per year total. Okay, uh, yeah. Last, last year we had uh, about eight. Wow, okay, yeah, that is pretty low. Um, so we have currently, we ended 2021 20, with 59 complaints. Um, what I would say with, with your complaint numbers, um, you know, at that level, that would free up your director to do more of the pattern and trend sort of analysis that can be very helpful to the department. Um, I, you know, I think it's natural, Chief, for, um, folks in your position to feel like, you know, who's this civilian coming in, never been a police officer, going to give us all this advice and recommendations. But if you can find the right person who has the right experience, they can be like 
a, a real assistance to your department. Whenever you're contemplating new policy changes or updates, you can, it's sort of another person you can provide that draft policy to who then can help you do some research, can look at best practices around the country, can look at how other cities, which you all as a department, I'm sure already do, but it can be sort of a, an additional person to, to help you do that. My, my chief here comes to me proactively with new potential policies and say, hey, give us, we're, we're about to go live with this in a couple of weeks, give us your input on this, make sure, so we can make sure we're comfortable with this policy, that we can defend every element of this policy before we launch it, before we put it out publicly. Um, it can, the, the, your, the your civilian oversight operation can, can help you as the chief, as sort of like a, a, an additional risk manager or risk assessor, uh, as someone who is seeing the complaints come through, they can help um, spot things, develop ideas to, to get ahead of any developing problems before it, it, it sort of grows into a much more difficult problem that is harder for you to root out. Um, so you know, if, you, if you create the right dynamic and you have the person with the right experience, they can really be an asset to your department, not only in terms of day-to-day -day assistance with policy and training and stuff, um, but also with, you know, frankly, the credibility and legitimacy of the department, um, which, you know, at some point and at some time it will probably come to under question, there may be a, you know, controversial incident or something. And to have, if you, you know, if your officers did the right thing and they followed policy, it can be very helpful and, and powerful for the department to have this civilian who is, as sometimes in the past has been critical of the department, but then to come out and say, actually, in this case, the officer followed policy and there was no policy violation. So it can help sort of normalize some of those events that can, not normalize is the wrong word. It can help sort of manage. I'm sorry, what's that, Dima? To legitimize maybe? Or... It, it can help. Um, bring clarity to incidents when there is a lot of when there is a lack of clarity and the media can be running with a story without all the facts making you know the the public um less trustful of the of your officers and your department and if that's not the case you can you know if they're reporting it out wrongly incorrectly you your monitor it's their obligation to come out and say what you know the truth what the accurate facts are um, you know, we're not just here to wag our finger at the police department and, and, and try to correct them when they do something wrong, but our job is to be independent of any sort of political pressures and be able to say, even when it's hard, that actually, no, in this case, the police department got it right or the officer got it right. And that's some of the hardest, that's sometimes the hardest role for, for those of us in this field, because you do feel sometimes pressure from the public and certain expectations from the public. But if you're doing the job, we have a saying in this field that I'll share with you all. It's a little crude, so I apologize. But um, if you, we, we say, if you, if you don't piss off everyone at some point, you're probably not doing your job properly because there will be times when you take positions, you make recommendations that are gonna frustrate the department or frustrate city leaders. But there also be times when you'll make recommendations or findings that the community um, may disagree with. Um, hopefully you can, the monitor can explain, provide the facts and, and uh, the reasoning for that decision. But, um, you know, it's, it's not just all about, you know, fussing at police officers and trying to hold them accountable. It's also about making sure the accurate facts and data are reported out to the public so that the public can have an informed and productive and constructive conversation um, instead of having sort of half truths or partial information and trying to, you know, figure out things on their own, um, you know, just through the media and stuff like you need, it's helpful to have someone who can kind of, that is, can be trusted by all sides and can put out the facts and say, all right, here's the facts. Now let's talk about what the solutions are, or what actually the problem may be. Um, so I know that was a little long-winded, but I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm wondering, does um, does Den or does Boulder have a fire? Uh, I'm sorry, a police commission, and if so, what's your relationship with that commission? So our police oversight panel is essentially what 
we have as a, it's not exactly a, a commission. Um, we have a, a more traditional, you know, city manager, police chief structure. And, but like Los Angeles has a police commission where they're actually these commissioners who are, you know, have authority over policy and training and disciplinary decisions. They, I think they're like, if not the only, one of the only civilian bodies that has that level of, of authority and power. Um, but that's, I think that's a very different setup than what we all have here. Um, so no, we don't exactly have a commission. Um, we have a police chief who has a command staff. If I may, um, Chief Malekian, Lieutenant Hill, Assistant City Attorney John Doimus, I was wondering if you had any questions for Mr. Lapari. First of all, thank you for being here. And I am. Thank you for being here, Chief. It's important for aware, you. I'm aware of you and I'm aware of your work and you have, you have an excellent reputation. No, thank you. I, I think the, um, Really, the only question I have, and it's it's uh, I don't want to sidetrack the discussion, but there, I was curious about uh, the your discussion about th this issue of recommending discipline, and I'm curious about why you regard that as um, an integral part of your work. And I don't know whether the experience in Boulder um, and with that department is different than in other places, because I know many places don't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm not. And, and without getting into the whole thing, I'm, you're you're preaching to the choir a little bit about most aspects of oversight. So All right. this isn't this isn't a battleground. But I, I do have questions about uh, about that aspect of it. And I, I, I wondered why uh, why you think that is so critical. Yeah. I think it's it's important both for the internal process and for the public perception of the credibility of the process. So on the internal side, it can be very beneficial for you as the final decision maker in these cases to hear members of the public who would be on this board and their perception of what the, say if a, if a incident or allegation was sustained and an officer was found to have violated policy, it can be very helpful for you to hear from members of the community about the impact of that harm as you try to assess, all right, how, how high should I go with this discipline? How, how much are the mitigating factors powerful or how much are the sort of aggravating factors powerful here? Um, We've had a couple, we've had an ins one case here so far where our panel, our command staff agreed that an officer had not operated, not performed their duties as they would want them done, but they didn't sustain it. They acknowledged that the officer needed some additional training uh, as a detective, actually, um, but, but they didn't sustain it. Our panel looked at it, recommended it be sustained, followed the matrix and felt like the, the discipline that the matrix was leading them to was higher than what they wanted to recommend. And so they, but they still felt like there was real harm done in the, the, the poor performance by the officer. And so they gave, ended up giving our chief a very sort of nuanced and thoughtful perspective from their view of why, yes, it should be sustained, even though your command staff is saying it shouldn't be sustained, but we do think you know the discipline here we have we've had trouble here deciding on the discipline because we think the matrix is a little too high for this and so what we would really like to recommend is this we're going to follow the recommend recommendation and recommend this to you i mean we're going to follow the matrix and make and give you this recommendation but we really felt like this lower level discipline while it should still be sustained this lower level discipline was more appropriate and our chief ended up um siding with our panel and saying, yeah, you know what, they're right. This should be sustained. And I understand what they're saying about the real harm here. Um, and she was able to use the matrix to find exactly the right 
level of discipline. That ex was what the, the board actually thought was more appropriate, but they are still kind of learning how to use the matrix. And so ultimately my point is that they were able to give the, our chief a perspective that did influence her decision and that she ultimately found helpful. Um, and it, you know, from an internal perspective too, you know, if it can sometimes give you a path to do something that you feel is the most appropriate thing when maybe your command staff isn't supporting you or the union's not supporting you. Um, it gives you another um, flank to, of support potentially whenever you're, you're carrying out um, something that may be hard internally for, for the department to, to take or to accept. Outside, externally, perception-wise, it's almost, it is routinely alleged against agencies, against oversight agencies or oversight operations that don't have the ability to make, that are actually reviewing cases and, and don't have the ability to then make a display recommendation. Oh, you're just a toothless tiger, um, you know, or a paper tiger, you're toothless. Um, so it, it can undermine the public's since, <clears throat> excuse me, the public sense that this is a real thing, that this is meaningful. Um, you know, I will say I, I can imagine a process where the oversight, the volunteer oversight board is making, solely making recommendations of whether to sustain or not sustain and not making a disciplinary recommendation. And if you're you know, if the, the culture of the department is to have really high ethics and to have a real sort of um, a, a, a sort of a, a ethical culture that drives your department, which I get the sense, you know, I'm not there in, in Santa Barbara, but I get the sense that that you all have have a good degree of that. If that's in place, it may not be as critical to for the board to make those disciplinary recommendations. But I think you will ultimately keep leave yourself open to the public constantly saying, well, you don't have any um, real power because you can't even make um, disciplinary recommendations. All you can make is this recommendation to sustain or not. And that can just create, you know, if, if the public doesn't have confidence in your process, there'll be, you know, ongoing efforts to constantly try to reform it, to try to give it more authority, more power, um, and that can be disruptive and inefficient to, to the process. And so, you know, striking that balance, I think, I think having the, the panel or board be able to make those recommendations within a, you know, as long as you have a disciplinary matrix, it, it becomes very difficult for a volunteer panel to make disciplinary recommendations if they don't have a disciplinary matrix or any kind of guidance to follow. Then it's just like, you feel like you're kind of making it up as you go along or you have to follow precedent or something. So if you you know, if you all have a, a matrix and they're following that, I think you will find that it's, it actually becomes less controversial than, than you may be imagining, um, which is easy to, to imagine when you don't have, when it's not in place and it, it, it can sort of feel like, you know, these folks are gonna make these off the wall, crazy disciplinary recommendations. They're gonna wanna fire every officer for everything that they do. Um, but if you have that disciplinary matrix, that, that really gives predictability and takes a lot of the guesswork out of what should the right discipline be. And then you, you're not debating vast differences in discipline, like whether should the officer should be retrained or fired. You're, develop, you're, you're discussing very nuanced differences in levels of discipline, um, whether it should be a, a one-year letter of reprimand or a two-year letter of reprimand. You all sort of end up in a fairly similar place, even though there might be some some minor disagreements over mitigating or aggravating circumstances that can push it up or down a little bit, but you're still going to be in basically the same range. And, you know, right now we, I can go to the public whenever members of our, of the public, you know, per, try to portray our operation as meaningless or, you know, not um, having any kind of impact or we, you know, we've had one case where our chief disagreed with the panel's recommendation and, and, did, and did not sustain it. And we had folks in the community who were alleging that, oh, this was a slap in the face to the panel 
but because the chief didn't listen to them for this one case, but I had seven other cases I could point to and a, 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 a um, concurrence rate of like 85% that I could point to the public and say, actually, in the vast majority of cases in six out of our seven cases that the board has reviewed so far, the, the chief has done, has carried out the discipline of that the, the panel has recommended. Uh, and in even this one case, the, the, the chief went with the panel's recommendation over the command staff's recommendation. And so it, it, it helps you and your city and your board make the case that no, this is a, we have a real disciplinary process in our city. Our chief is carrying out discipline largely consistent with what we are recommending. Hopefully that will be the case. Um, and it likely will be if you all are well, operating off a disciplinary matrix. And so it gives the public confidence in you that, that you as the police chief and your command staff are actually you know, pretty consistent with the expectations of the public. Um, and that gives you, know, you credibility and it, it protects you and the department from unfair allegations of you know, that, that you're not disciplining your officers or you're not taking discipline seriously. So if it's done right, it can be a, it's, it can be a real benefit. Um, I would encourage you if you haven't to reach out to our chief here in Boulder, Chief Harold. Um, and I, I think you'd hear similar things from her. And um, I've also been able to jump in in areas where there was difficulty or controversy between city operations and the police department where, as you probably know, you know, sometimes police departments are, feel a little separated from the rest of the city, the rest of the city staff and city colleagues don't really understand the world they live in and the challenges that they have. And so here in Boulder, you know, we had a citywide effort to, to train all city staff in anti-bias and um, what we call microaggression, you know, basically like insults to people. And, and it, was, it was for all city staff. We initially had some police officers go through it along with other city staff. And in the midst of the, the moment we are in sort of nationally, the language that was being used, the tone of it, it really made the officers defensive and they could not, they did not feel like they could participate in it um, productively. And so the police department kind of pulled out of that training, but they, they still recognized the need and the desire to have the officers go through that training, but they weren't comfortable with the way the training was initially designed and, and, and provided to the police department. And so they asked, they, the chief came to me and the police department came to me and said, hey, you understand our department. You've been dealing with us for a good year now. You understand what our, you know, officers are defensive about. I also had a background in teaching African American history, so I was comfortable talking about race and and bias and that sort of stuff. And so I was able to jump into that and work with our internal affairs sergeant and um, and a consult and an outside consultant to sort of revise that training in a way that made it relevant to the work that and the lives that the police officers have. And so we talked about, you know, what about bias against police officers and what all have you, you all have experienced in the past two years, how you've been treated sometimes by members of the public, you know, you feel stereotyped sometimes, right? And so we were able to introduce that discussion of some really difficult stuff like white supremacy, concepts of white supremacy and, and white privilege, things that naturally make not only police officers, but frankly, white men like myself and, and you uncomfortable. And I, we were able to have that conversation with the officers in a way that they saw the value in that discussion. And they, they, they didn't feel attacked. They didn't feel like they were the target of um, accusations. They saw how it was relevant to the work that they do every day on the street and the, see, the things that they see out on the street. And, you know, we talked about how they deal with you know, the white privilege of some of our college students here and, um, and the expectations of, you know, some of our wealthier folks. And they had never thought of white privilege in that term, in those terms. Um, and they always just thought of it as like, oh, we, we just have some folks in our community who are too entitled. But when we talked about it, they realized, oh, what you're describing is white privilege stuff is actually relevant to the, the calls that we go on. We never really thought of it this way. And so if you can find somebody who can kind of understand both sides, speak both languages, they can sort of step into those gaps sometimes where it feels like 
the rest of the city, the rest of the public, civilians don't understand what we're going through as police officers or as a police department, and sometimes can explain to the public, you know, vice versa, and can kind of be that that go between between the the public and the and the police department. Um, in the right context, with the right personalities involved, that can work. Um, you know, you don't want the you have to be careful about your director or your monitor being perceived as um, you know, you know too close to the police or you know uh, in favor of the police so it's it's a delicate balance to walk um for those of us in this field but um we can we can be adaptive we can find solutions where sometimes it's hard to see solutions um and so i, I think if we're doing our job right it's police departments ultimately come to appreciate the work we're doing and see the value in it. And um, that's that can definitely happen. So, you know, the more you are in, as the chief and your command staff are involved in this process and, and take this process seriously and and support it, um, I think the better at the, the outcomes that you get, you will feel better about them in the long run and they will be beneficial to the public, to the city and to your police department. I'll stop there. Sorry, that was a little long-winded, but it's a it's a understandable concern um, that you have, Chief. Anything else from any other questions from any other command staff or or city attorneys or any other city leaders? Because I know this can be a a scary process to go through when you're in the middle of it. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns that you all may have as well. I, I had two questions. First of all, can you, can you hear me well? I'm, I'm trying. Out. I can so, hear you perfectly. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Like, first of all, thank you so much for um, your presentation. You actually your discussion with us today has been really helpful. Um, and and I and I had two two questions. One was um, you mentioned before that uh, the uh, in Boulder uh, the commission has given a budget to um, deal with issues when, when it comes to uh, getting independent legal counsel. So on this uh, conflict, can you, can you give examples I, of the conflict you've given? And, and the second question I have is, um, you, 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 so you follow a matrix. And the matrix, of course, is a very good idea to have from a human resources perspective to make sure there's no disparate impact of treatment claims. You want to be you know, fair across the board, obviously, dealing with disciplined employees. Uh, have you ever had a situation where um, discipline was imposed where it went against the, the matrix, at least the board, and, 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 and how was that dealt with? So those are my two questions. And again, thank you so much uh, uh, for tonight. It's been, it's been wonderful to hear. Really. Oh, absolutely, John. Thank you um, for the questions. Uh, two very good questions. Um, the Your first question, um, have we, I, I'm happy to report that we have not had a conflict of interest yet. Um, we've, we've only been doing this for a year and a half and I, I don't see any on the horizon um, and the way we've, the way I presented this to the city attorney when we, when I first came to town and we were talking about what, what the police oversight budget would look like, um, I simply asked for uh, about $15,000 to have in my budget that would stay there. And you, I don't know the sort of pay scale for attorneys out there. You may need to raise that or lower that, but I wanted to have a, a little pot of money that if we ran into a conflict of interest, I could tap into that, bring in an outside legal counsel. Uh, but the idea is that hopefully we don't have to use that. And each year that money just rolls over and it's it's there sort of break this glass in case of emergency. <laughs> and and it's, it's there if you need it. Um, but hopefully you don't. Um, I'm glad to say I, I haven't needed it so far in Boulder. I'll say in, in Syracuse, um, I, did I did have that need. Um, we had, it was a much different sort of political culture and police culture there. And the police chief there at a certain point stopped. Um, he was also required to respond in writing to our, our panel, our board's recommendations. And at a certain point he stopped doing that. Um, and we ultimately had to um, file an article in court to, to get a judge to say that he was required to do that. Um, and, you know, ideally you, you would want to try to resolve that through the city attorney's office and or maybe the city council um, when you run into those kinds of things. But unfortunately, we didn't have a situation where it would be resolved based, you know, consistently with the law through the political process or through the 
the, the city attorney process. And so you can avoid the need or the likelihood of ever ending up like that if you if the city attorney is you know fully engaged in the process, supportive of the process, looking for solutions. Um, that only really happens when you have a situation where it feels like the the city has and or the police department is kind of turning against the oversight operation and and doesn't want the operation to to operate. Um, I'm happy to say, you know, that was at the beginning of my career many years ago. I, I, I think the process in Syracuse has improved uh, considerably since then. There's been a new chief, a new mayor and everything. But, um, you know, it's good to have it in case of emergency, but hopefully you can create a dynamic where you never actually have to use it. But it gives it can give the public confidence too that you all take this very seriously and not only the, the board members take it seriously, but the city takes it seriously and will respect if there is a conflict of interest that the city won't try to run over the, the oversight operation and, and sort of disregard the, the, the claims or the interests of the, the board, but will deal with them as equals. And um, it just kind of sets a better tone, I think, to, to work together going forward. Um, your second question, I talked so long, I forgot what the second question was. <laughs> um, no, no, no problem. You're talking about <clears throat> having a matrix, and I'm wondering if you've ever had experience where uh, the board went outside the matrix. And so that way, the problem is that now you've had inconsistent discipline, either in employees being disciplined too lenient based on the matrix or maybe too severe compared right. to similar violations in the past. So have you ever had that situation and how was it dealt with? We haven't had a situation where the panel went way outside the um the, the matrix. Um, we've had one case, as I said earlier, where the panel sustained the case and the chief didn't think it should be sustained. And so they had obviously made um, a disciplinary recommendation there, but because the chief didn't sustain it, it, it wasn't a question of is the discipline right? It was more of a question was the determination, the disposition right? Um, but that's part of the process. You know, the, the chief in almost all of these operations, the chief or maybe a city manager or something has the ultimate say, the final decision um, in discipline. And, you know, I, I think it should be recognized that often we will get sort of calls by members of the public to have the, a board, a civilian board like this, actually be able to impose discipline. I actually think it's really important for the culture of the police department to have the person in charge of the police department and their command staff implement the discipline. If it's seen as coming from outside, it, it can be just kind of discarded and say, even if they carry out the discipline, it can be seen as like, well, this isn't really what we thought was right. And so it doesn't really address maybe the, the perception within the department that this is okay for us to do. Whereas if the discipline is coming from the chief and the command staff, it, it's a clear message to the department and to the officers that, hey, this is what we expect. Um, we're gonna be consistent in this. And that's how you, you know, either control cultures or change cultures if it, if it needs to be changed. Um, so yeah, we haven't really had a situation. I mean, the I think the panel members actually like the matrix because if you don't have any guidelines, when you get to the end of the case and you sustain it, you can be like, you, you can end up with, you know, five different people having five different disciplinary recommendations and they can get creative and it can be difficult to actually find a compromise of what would actually make sense and, and be effective and productive. And so um, I, I think the, the board members who are, will be engaged in this process will like to have the matrix. Um, and then if there are ever parts of the matrix where they, they feel that, oh, this is too light, of a discipline for this kind of violation, your discussion then becomes about what the matrix should look like. And should we, should this violation have some stronger disciplinary options as opposed to what we currently have? And that's a much more structured um, kind of predictable conversation. And it's not going off in lots of different directions. It kind of gives some structure to that conversation and some, some sense of what's, in bounds and what's way out of bounds. Um, so I, I found that the board members have liked having the matrix and, and have been very consistent in using it. They're still learning how to sort of apply aggravating and mitigating factors to go up or down the scale. Um, 
they're just starting to work with it. But I think the more they work with it, um, the, the more they, they're going to like it because they're going to have even more, a little bit of flexibility and it, it may not feel as sometimes at, early on when you start using a matrix, it can feel overly structured and feel like, oh, it's stopping me from going to the discipline that I think we should go in the direction of. But um, the more you use it as you adapt it and make it, you know, the right fit for your department and your community, it actually is a huge help to, to have those matrices or to have a matrix. I hope that answers your question. Man. No, I did. I just have one, one, one small line of follow-up. Does uh, either Syracuse or Boulder any of the cities you work with have a separate commission that uh, an employee can appeal discipline to? So for example, in Santa Barbara, uh, most of the department are civil service employees. So right. uh, they can appeal to the civil service commission and discipline. And you, you talk about the importance of at least management issuing that. I use it, for example, uh, one of my witnesses in these cases will be, will be not just for the police department, other departments will be the, the management who issued the discipline, right? Because I have them testify as why do they pick this level of discipline and why, why does it need to be supported or sustained by the civil service commission? So, uh, so this, the cities that you work with also have like an appeals board uh, on the discipline uh, and, and how did, how did that turn out uh, in terms of how, how does the board at least, um, you know, respect the, the the discipline decision of another board. Uh -huh. Have you had an experience on that, or, or no? Yeah. So in in Boulder, we don't have like a, a separate civil service commission. There is a a process where an officer can appeal the chief's discipline to the city manager, and then the city manager can be the final decision maker. And even beyond that, if they still disagree with it or they still want to fight it there is an arbitration process. Um, although we haven't had a, a police disciplinary case go to arbitration in anyone's recent memory. Um, I've asked around and they all say, yeah, we have an arbitration process, but I don't remember any case ever going to one. Um, and I think that reflects, you know, the, the consistency and predictability and the reasonableness of, you know, how our, our department has imposed discipline. Um, in Syracuse, there was a civil service commission. Honestly, we didn't see a whole lot of discipline being imposed by the chief when I was there in Syracuse. And so I don't think there was ever a, a reason for the officers to go outside of the disciplinary process to go to the civil service commission, unfortunately. Um, it was, but that's my honest answer on, <laughs> um, I, you know, most cases, I don't, I don't know how it is there in California and in, in Santa Barbara. I've never done the work in, in the state of California, but what's, what's the, how many of your cases end up going to getting challenged or appealed through the, the city uh, or through the um, civil service commission? Uh, police department wide or yeah. in, in general? Police department, oh, wow. Um, it's been years. <laughs> this is a good one, oh. so. Okay, well, that, that's good. Then. Um, that may not then it, it's something that the board would need to be aware of as a part of the process and that 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 could happen. Um, but if it's if you haven't had any recent in recent memory like we have haven't had any here in Boulder, then maybe it's not. It's a maybe it's a problem on only on paper and not in in practice. Um, but it, it you should you all should give some thought to it and you're. you're board members should be aware of it. But if it's, you know, if it's a part of the legal landscape in the state of California, it is something that your board, the board would have to be aware of and respect and deal with. Yeah, as Commissioner Alonzo said, the, the, the issues is we, you know, um, well, we have what's called a Skelly hearing, so a pre-hearing, and then we have our civil service commission. But our biggest conflict is um, that the, the, the power of discipline has been, is, is, under the basically the jurisdiction of the city administrator or his or her de delegates and it's not assigned to a board and in fact um there's language in the city charter talking about the council council can't issue uh discipline right and and a lot of that law is based on this is in the 1960s so political patronage and all this is still fresh in the mind right so right. You know, you, you, and they're not involved in the hiring or processing decisions so if the city council can be part of that you, you couldn't have a subsequent or subordinate more, more do that. So that, that would be something that would require a charter amendment, but uh, as Commissioner Lazo said, so 
But thank you, thank you for asking my questions. They're really, really helpful and give me just insight into other jurisdictions and, and the process and the examples we face. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Wanted to maybe invite the board or the community members back in. I know I just spent a lot of time kind of talking directly to the chief and, and John, but um, there are any other questions or areas that you all would want to cover? And I will just put out there that on on all fronts, um, both board members, um, city leaders, police department leaders, if you all have additional questions or concerns that you think of after this call, feel free to reach out to me or other parts of, of our city. Um, I know we, we'd all be happy to provide whatever support that we can. Yeah, Lizzie. Um, I'm just curious, other than what you shared with us thus far, what is what would you say is um, some of the top lessons that you've learned? I think the number one lesson I've I would preach is that whether or not you have your entity actually conducting investigations, it's really important to have the civilian sort of in the midst of those investigations in real time and to be able to speak to their board with credibility that yes, I'm, I'm seeing these, what's happening here, I'm at the interviews um, and can you know report not just from paper documents that they receive from the police department, but that can actually go into the police department, develop a good working relationship with the department, um, and really have a good understanding of what's happening internally inside the department. I think um, not keeping the, the, the person at arm's length on the outside is really important. Bring them, bring them, let them get into the department and, and really have an inside view um, is really probably the most important thing because your board members and your panel members won't have that ability from the outside, from their role. They're going to be relying mostly on you know, the documents that they're receiving and they're going to have to have trust in the, the director that the director's providing things and reporting things to them, you know, accurately. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably the most important thing is having having a civilian that both sides can trust right there in the, in the middle of the work um, and not not on the outside. Um, and I, I think the other thing I would really stress is that's really important that I've seen as being really important. I know you've probably heard this from Cami as well. Keep this process that it seems like you all have of keeping everyone in the discussion, keeping your police chief in the discussion, your union in the discussion if they haven't been a part of it, um, your city attorneys, you know, your elected officials, city council. Um, don't let it get to a point where it, it becomes like one little group's project that they're working on a corner of they're working on it in a corner by themselves and nobody else in the city knows what they're working on or what they're about to propose keep everyone in the loop keep everyone um, committed to this mission that you all have embarked on uh, i think that's really really key because if if you lose that ability to talk to each other and to to reason with each other and to listen to each other most importantly um everything else becomes harder everything else becomes certain things will become impossible and so being really focused on on trying to keep that dialogue um, productive and it will get tough at times and people will need to disagree with each other and need to have different perspectives and different views but um, trying to keep that perspective that we're all actually trying to build something together here for the benefit of the public um, I think is is really important to carry with you um let me i'd like to invite cammy in because cammy has got a lot if she's still i can't see all the folks who are still here but if cammy's here and if there's anything cammy has seen um from her all of her experience as well um sort of the most critical elements or the things that folks need to know so they've all heard from me probably more than they care to over the last several months but can i i have one question for you um that i thought of because you're talking about 
you know, not having any additional support staff really does mean that you have to make decisions about what can happen now and what can happen later. Exactly. When does when do you manage in that? Because I'm I'm still trying to figure out how you do what you're doing without what you're going to be doing next year or in the next six months. How are you doing community outreach? What does that look like right now? Well, that's a, such an important question that we haven't talked about yet. And um, honestly, one, I wouldn't say benefit, but one outcome of the pandemic going on for the past two years is that it's made out meaningful outreach pretty difficult to do. And um, in, in, in some ways, we, we haven't really tried to do much. And that's, it's, it's not great. Um, it's something that we are gearing up to begin now that the, the mask mandate has ended and people are beginning to be able to get together back in public again. We actually formed a subcommittee on our panel to do like an outreach and, and public education subcommittee to really let the, the panel members use their expertise of the community. Because the other challenge here, I've just came in from Chicago a year and a half ago. I, you know, I'm in the process of learning all the community organizations and, and the community dynamics, but the people who have been living here for their whole life know that better than I do. And so we made a conscious decision to rely on the panel to actually um, help design our outreach strategy, um, to help identify the organizations we wanted to reach out to, to give the me as the monitor some direction on what they wanted to see. And so that has not really been an area that I've had to invest a whole lot of time in just because of the pandemic, frankly. Um, in the normal, normal circumstances, I think I would have, and I would have been, I would have here in Boulder, I would have had folks in the rest of the city to rely on to help sort of for administrative support of that. But I am, that is one of my considerations going forward is if, if I'm going to need a second person, what is the, the time commitment going to look like for the monitor here um, for doing meaningful outreach? Because yeah, we haven't talked about this yet, <clears throat> so I'm so glad you brought this up, but doing good outreach is really time consuming and you're doing it in the evenings, you're doing it on the weekends, when people are available, um, you're going to lots of community meetings, um, and that's just, it's just time intensive. Um, and so that should be definitely a part of your consideration. Now that we're all coming out of the pandemic, you should definitely be thinking about, you know, how much time you you expect your director or their staff to be devoting to outreach and making sure you have the resources to do that. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, at the next couple of months as we start to ramp up, relying heavily on our subcommittee, our outreach subcommittee and our city's communications staff. Um, they have been very supportive and helping us when we had had to get messages out and, and put out press releases and stuff. Um, our city communication staff has been very helpful. So that's that's another that's an angle we haven't talked about that about yet. But your city's communication staff should be brought in probably sooner rather than later um, to think about how they're going to be a part of this. Because um, there is a challenge there with okay, the city's communications team they speak on behalf of the city, and sometimes there could be concerns with um, well. The board has its own voice and how do we manage the board getting its own voice and its own perspective out through the organ of the city without the city kind of taking over that process and then it becoming the city's press release and so having you know direct thoughtful conversations between your board your director and your your communicate your city communication staff um, can be critical as well and making sure everyone's on the same page and thinking about how to handle public statements, uh, public relations going forward. Thanks for that, Joey. What else? Anything else? I have my dog joining us here, so uh, you may <laughs> provide some input too. Well, if no one else has any questions, I just want to thank you again, Joey, for um, being here. Um, Absolutely, my pleasure. And like I said, if I'm sure you all will have more questions and you know more issues that arise down the road, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me or um, or my daughter or my dog here, <laughs> uh, or, or or the rest of our city. Uh, Boulder is a very 
um, proud of the process that we put together. And I think, you know, our chief, our city manager, our, our city councilors would be happy to connect with any any of their sort of counterparts on the other side to provide any insight or assistance they can. So don't hesitate to ask. I was just going to say thank you. And uh, I just think you showed that like the demeanor and just the personality of the of that role is really important to build like such yeah. a it's so crucial. So I think you're a testament to that. So thank you so much for just showing us that. Thank you, Nemo. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. And I do I do agree with that. It, it is the 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 individuals in oversight, it, it, the person doing the oversight is is can be really important and, and really critical um, at, at certain times. So that's a good point. Thank you, Dima. And thank you all. <clears throat> thank you so much. This was amazing and um, very insightful for us. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be taking you up on your offer of uh, following up with questions and, and trying to get more information. But this is perfect for where we're at in the process as well as we try to finalize our recommendations and appreciate your feedback on the rec draft recommendations as well. You got it. All right. That was fun. And uh, I do look forward to hearing from you all more in the future. And uh, thanks for uh, including me in this. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right. Have a great night. Have a good night, everyone. And uh, Sam, if we can open up public comment uh, before we close out this item. Sure. Give me one second. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item six, discussion with an auditor monitor professional, please raise your hand. If there's anyone in the public that would like to speak on item six, please click on the hand raise feature. There are no hands raised, Chair. Thank you, Sam. So Sam, with that- Actually, I'm oh, wondering, is ahead. this appropriate to read that email that um, our, the attendee um, sent us? That you forwarded is this would this be a good time to read that or is that just a, 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 a like a separate thing uh, we can read it into record i have no issues with that i've already sent that over to the commission and to john doimus and sean hill give me one second so i can pull up the email Uh, the question, uh, the comment is um, listening to the webinar and enjoying the presentation given by Joseph Lipari. I've served several terms on the Santa Barbara County Grand Jury and just completed my second term as four person. It seems that the process Joseph is suggesting and is using is much like how we process grand jury complaints. My only comment at this point is that it should not be the chairman alone to make decisions on whether or not to accept a complaint. It should be considered by an executive team of two or three not by one single person. And it sounds as though once a complaint has been approved, it is assigned to a committee, which is exactly how the grand jury operates. Very interesting. Thank you for allowing me to listen in, Pam Olson. So uh, that's now part of the record. That's thank all. you, Sam. And Chair thank you, Lizzie, for um, highlighting that. So we will close out item six. We will move on to item seven, which is future business, and then we can carry on with the rest of our evening. So for future business, the only, um, I wanted to run this by the group. Uh, we, now that we have our deadline, which is April 22nd, we are gonna have to get quite a bit done. And what I'm thinking and I've been discussing with Chief Malekian and Lieutenant Hill about on the 23rd, so in two weeks, we would have a meeting and uh, they would develop a memo with feedback on the draft recommendations with, from the perspective of the Santa Barbara Police Department, so we would get an opportunity to hear from them, discuss it, um, ask questions. And then uh, the following week, since the survey closes on the 22nd, CCI is going to need a little bit of time to develop a preliminary uh, feedback from both the focus groups and the surveys. And so I was thinking on the 30th is when we would get that information, be able to ask CCI some uh, questions, discuss it amongst ourselves. And then from that point on, we can start editing and discussing the draft recommendations and finalize those. So um, we are possibly looking at four weeks back to back of meetings. Um, 
but if we structure it like that, I feel like the first two should be uh, shorter. And then when we start finalizing the recommendations, um, we're just gonna have to kind of go through it. But I wanted to get feedback on that uh, approach and then also get feedback on um, whether or not people feel comfortable with in-person meetings or if we wanna keep it virtual. I know oh, yeah. for, for me, it would be preferable to be online just for just for personal reasons. Um, I know that we want to see each other, but for me, it's it would be much harder for me to get there. Thank you. Christian. I was just going to say the same as uh, uh, Louisa. Um, it's uh, it's hard for me to schedule um, with travel time uh, and I barely make it to this meeting uh to like get to my desk and sit down and fire up zoom uh in time every every week to get here um so i would i would prefer just out of for flexibility to make sure that we get max participation uh to keep it virtual or hybrid if possible sounds great chief maliki you're muted chief I want to comment about the 23rd. It, my assumption would be that you will not have the feedback from, from the survey and therefore they're on the 23rd and, and therefore the recommendations as they're currently written. Um, I guess my question is, do you, would you anticipate any changes based on the survey or the focus groups? Uh, because the, the, the white paper or the memo we discussed was really based on that being the department's sort of final position on, on issues. And I'm, I'm not clear that on the 23rd, you will know what those are. Well, it, what would be helpful, in my opinion, is to have the um, department's position on the draft recommendations and then also get the survey information and the focus group information so that when we go to finalize our recommendations, we're as well informed as possible so that we can have really robust conversations as we finalize the recommendation. Well, I've sent the recommendation. I mean, if, if the, the recommendation matrix that, and I'll, I'll resend it, that went out, I think on the, uh, in late February, I think it was dated the 24th, um that's based on the most current recommend you know on the current draft recommendations and and my my only thought was is that what was going to change was if, if the, anything from the survey we could certainly discuss that on the 23rd i'm happy to do that and i will resend what i uh, what i have but it's if the if the recommendations won't be changed by then neither will my response matrix so well, if I if I may, maybe we'll follow up after the meeting, but it would also be helpful to because um, I've seen the, the matrix, obviously, but if there were suggestions on changes, because um, sometimes in the and I don't want to go too much in detail, but um, it sounds like there could be support, but then it just kind of stops there. So. Um, maybe we'll connect afterwards to talk about what it could look like for the 23rd, and we can certainly have a discussion at the very least on the matrix that you provided. I'm happy to convert that matrix into a into a written memo. That's that's easily done. Um, and that's fine. We can talk about that. Thank you, Chief. Lizzie? I just think it would be helpful to to have that conversation on the or the discussion on the twenty third um, because uh, the the memo is a document and um, having having that discussion in this in this meeting would be a discussion so we could ask more questions about you know the thought process on that and it includes the public um, so anybody who's watching or will be watching would would have an understanding because I think that memo was. I don't know if that's posted on the website right now, so it's not it's not open for for the public to to view and understand. Thank you, Lizzie. 
All right, so that is um, the future plan. So as we get closer to the 22nd, um, that's gonna be the strategy. And if anyone has any concerns, you could always reach out. I, I believe at the next meeting, we're also possibly going to um, discuss who wants to present. So uh, if you wanna be a part of the group that presents at the meeting, it's gonna be a joint meeting with the CFD and city council. Um, start thinking about it over the next couple of weeks and reach out if you have any questions or concerns and we will be asking at the next meeting. All right, anything else from the group? If not, then we will adjourn the meeting at 7.53. Thank you all. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Get good the night, survey everybody. out. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. Good night.